In this lesson, we're going to talk about something rather controversial, hydrogen. The gas isn't controversial, but could it be the missing link for renewable energy, the one thing that will actually help this whole renewable transformation succeed? Or is it a colossal con job, a, a, a spurious thing that's going to waste huge amounts of money and produce nothing useful? I'll let you judge for yourself. So, what are we trying to solve by using hydrogen? Well, here is the diagram showing all the different uh, forms of CO2 emission. And some things like power generation and uh, passenger cars can be fixed by the things we talked about already, renewable energy, electric cars and so on. But there are some that are hard. For example, freight over long distances like trucks or ocean liners or planes. Um, a lot of industry, iron, steel, cement, chemicals, and so on, are very hard to abate using current technologies. And those between them add up to a substantial fraction of the CO2 emission. Unless we can do something about that, we're not going to keep temperatures under control. So I would say that the problem areas for decarbonizing, so one is industry, things like making steel, cement, fertilizer, which between them are 15% or so of CO2 emissions. Then there's long haul transport, things like ocean shipping and long haul aircraft. Then there's the fact that while some countries like Australia have plenty of land to build wind turbines and plenty of sunshine for solar cells, other countries don't. If you're Singapore or Japan or the United Kingdom, uh, small cloudy countries without huge amounts of land, then in these cases renewable energy is much trickier. One solution might be nuclear, but wouldn't it be nice if you could store up the renewable energy in places that have lots of it, like Australia, and send them to the countries that need it, like Japan. And there's also a fourth problem, what to do during those rare extended periods of high energy demand when it's cloudy and no wind. This is fairly rare, but you do sometimes get a week or so with constant clouds and no wind. What do you do then? These are all things that hydrogen might, in principle, be able to address. So here's how the process works. The basic idea is that you use renewable energy, like wind turbines and solar cells, and feed that energy into an electrolyzer. An electrolyzer takes water and, using membranes and catalysts and some complicated chemistry, converts it into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen can then be used in various forms. It can be sent directly to industry for things like making fertilizers or producing steel. It can be used for transport, for planes and ocean liners and things like that. It could be stored in some form, maybe pressurized or frozen or converted into methane or something like this, and then sent down pipelines or in tankers to transport the energy to countries like Japan with fewer renewables, so it's much more portable than sunlight. Or you could store it in some giant set of tanks for those rare periods of no wind and no sun, in which case you can then uh, use it to generate electricity. So that's the basic story. A crucial part of this, of course, is electrolyzers. Electrolyzers are devices, you may have done this as a science experiment at school, where you just get a couple of plates and put electricity through them and it generates hydrogen and oxygen. But you can do it much more efficiently than that. They're currently 70 to 80 percent efficient, that they are quite expensive. Uh, they're 80, 70 to 80 percent efficient at converting electric energy into the chemical energy of hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is appealing because it has a very high energy density. If you remember, lithium-ion batteries only have about one megajoule per kilogram, and whereas uh, hydrocarbons are typically several tens, so petrol is about 50 megajoules per kilogram, and that, of course, has always been the drawback of um, electric vehicles, that they need a lot of batteries to store their energy. This is getting better, but it's got a long way to go to catch up with petrol. But look at hydrogen, 120 megajoules per kilogram. That's way more than petrol or natural gas, even. 
And in fact, this has been noticed for a long time, and some of the most efficient rocket engines in the world, like the one here on the Blue Origin space probe uh, rocket, use hydrogen. You can tell it's using hydrogen because the, the exhaust is transparent. That's a giveaway of hydrogen as opposed to kerosene or some other rocket fuel. And these ones give you the most possible speed of exhaust for your given um, amount of mass. So it's very appealing for rockets. And it's possible to convert the hydrogen back into electricity. Not You can do it by a traditional heat engine, by burning it. But there's a better option, using a fuel cell. Uh, once again, this is a chemical process with involving membranes and catalysts and the like, which will convert hydrogen back into electricity with about 50% efficiency, which is better than internal combustion engines and can be higher. And fuel cells like this have been around for over 100 years. They were used to power the space shuttle, and they're what currently power hydrogen-fueled cars. Now, this whole idea is actually very appealing to some governments. The uh, government of Australia is very keen on hydrogen, as is countries like Japan. So why? Well, in principle, it could make countries like Australia into energy superpowers. The basic idea, Australia is currently a major energy exporter. We export huge amounts of coal and natural gas, methane, to Asia. But that's all going to stop if we take, the world takes serious steps to decarbonise, because this is all the coal and natural gases burning and producing CO2 and heating the world up. So we could be losing a fair chunk of the economy of Australia, but maybe we can use hydrogen to replace what we're about to lose. Um, we have abundant renewable energy resources, sun and wind, um, and maybe we can use them to produce renewable hydrogen, which we then export. Or we could use the energy and produce hydrogen to produce, for example, clean steel or clean fertilizers produced using uh, processes that don't release CO2 and then sell them to other countries. So it's a form of embedded renewable energy rather than a country, uh, say Germany, producing its own steel using coal-fired power. They could buy this nice clean environmental steel from Australia, saving a lot of power in Germany where they're going to have more trouble with renewable powers and uh, helping Australia's economy. And maybe you can convert the hydrogen to replacements for petrol for use in an aircraft like e-fuels. So could Australia become a renewable energy superpower? I mean, Australia has abundant sunlight. We've seen this graph before. The solar radiation over large parts, particularly outback Australia, is very high and far more than in most industrialised countries. We've also got a lot of wind resources. This is a map showing uh, typical wind speeds, and you can see there's a large part of Australia with good wind speeds, and a lot of it's very empty, desolate country uh, where people aren't going to complain. Whereas if you're in like, Japan or England trying to put wind turbines up, everywhere you build it's going to be next to a village or a farm, and you're going to get complaints. So it could even lead to a geopolitical transformation. Over the last hundred years or so, the countries that had oil and gas have been very powerful, very rich. Wars have been fought over them. Could it be that in the next hundred years it'll be the countries with the renewable resources that will have the money and the power and hopefully not have wars fought over them?